Aruba's still there. It's, it's, it was good. Um, this morning, if you have your Bibles, open up to Psalm 73. And uh, we're going we're gonna, to, I'm going to start a series coming up. Uh, actually, it's going to be in January is when I'm going to really hit it. But we're going to go through uh, most of the book of 1 John. Since Kenny keeps leading this let's take a book thing. Um, but I'm going to um, share a little bit about the theme of what, 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 what's on my heart and why. And I think we're going to do the communion at the end, and we'll get to that in a minute. But Psalm 73 is going to be a, a passage that is just very mean. Let me, there's my notes. But to start out, First John chapter, uh, chapter 1, we're going to, don't, don't, do it, don't turn there. This is January. So uh, let, me just, let, me, let me back up. So a couple weeks ago, I was uh, flying into North Carolina for, to, to, to go to a job. And a friend of mine asked me to listen to a series um, and for those that know John Mavirius, real good. And I said, sure. So on the flight, I downloaded it, and I was listening to it. And then I had a two-hour drive to the job site. And so I drove all the way there. And so but for, I'm going like five hours into this series now. And I'm not a big, those that don't know me, I don't, I don't listen to mess. I mean, I like preachers. I don't listen to a lot of messages with this, but I, I couldn't turn the thing off. And so then I get to the job, and I look at the boy. They were already working. And I said, hey, guys, don't be, don't, I'm not trying to be rude, but I put my headphones in. I said, I'm not done yet. I got, I, I got to listen to this thing. And so for the next two and a half, three hours, I listened to like eight hours of teaching. And what it was, it was something that wasn't supposed to be for me. It was to be something that somebody said, would you just listen to this because it's something that's been ministering to me. I'm like, oh, that really doesn't apply. But as I did it, I was driving from um, Charlotte over to wherever I was going. And the Lord just began to deal with me on some things and some, some uh and showing me some things in my own life through a, a series that I would have never imagined. And so as I did that, this was probably, uh, oh, six weeks ago or so, I told Kenny, I said, I really think the Lord's stirring something in me. I want to start it. I want to just do something on But I wanted to wait. I wanted to continue to work it out. And so what it is is in 1 John 2, it talks about how we have an advocate how, with a father. And, we, and, when, when, and, and this whole series was about overcoming strongholds and stuff in your lives. And... I just really believe as a, as a church, when we start understanding, and this is where it ties into where last week we're just going to go into uh, Psalm 73. When as, a, as Christians, if we continually are focusing on the world around us and not getting our time one-on-one -on -one with the Lord, we're going to have a perspective that's out of balance. And I realize even in my life, as much as I think I seek the Lord every day and I pray and try to live my life and honor him and been, been, obviously been in, in the ministry for 25 plus years and almost um, well if you count co the college ministry I did before pushing 30 years and and you know what you can still allow things and perspectives to change if you're not careful and so the Lord began to deal with my heart on some things and I'll share that more in January with you but as he began to show some things in my heart I was like wow this is really powerful and so I listened to the whole series I'm not going to ruin it I'm not going to even go there right now but as we did that he the Lord began to speak to this to my heart. That's where I want to start this morning with you. If we are Christians and we're looking at the world through, through, the, through the perspective of the world's point of view, we're going to see things the wrong way. We're going to see sin one way. We're going to see uh, victory one way. We're not going to see it from God's perspective. And, uh, and, and I joke, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an avid Michigan fan. So yes, last night my son and I were, were at Cons Lucas Oil. And by the way, not, not, not just once, but this is three years in a row that uh, my Michigan Wolverines have, by the way, taken the crown. No, 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 no. Just let you know, Zach, we missed you last night, by the way. But anyway, uh, we, but you know what's funny? You're at that crowd. There's 65,000 people screaming for one team, and uh, the other team didn't have as many fans as we did by a long shot. But, you know, when you're looking at a perspective, I was talking to Tom this morning, and there was a, a debatable call that took place on the field last night. went, went Michigan's favor for once. And when it did... Tom was like, oh, that was a bad call. And I'm thinking, wait, I watched the replay. And of course, I saw it completely different. You know why? Because I'm a Michigan fan. I'm sitting eight rows, 40-yard line, and I could see the play happen right in front of me. And I mean, as soon as it happened, I'm yelling, the ref called it wrong. It's wrong. They reviewed it, and they overturned to Michigan's favor. And I'm sitting there watching the whole play. I knew I was right. The refs confirmed I was right. However, not everybody agrees with that call. You ever watch basketball? If you, watch, if you watch sports, this is a really fun thing. When you're looking at things from a certain perspective, you're going to see it through those eyes. Tom, I'm not wrong. Why? Because I'm a Michigan fan. <laughs> 
you know, the Alabama face mask and the pastor fairness calls and all the calls they got yesterday. You know what? I guarantee you, Christy didn't see one of those. But all over social media was, you know, Georgia got robbed. Guess what? That's the fun of living in a world with perspectives. As Christians, however, bringing it back home, we need to realign our perspectives. We have a world, when we have a worldly point of view looking at the world around us, we allow ourselves to get um, wrongly focused. So to start with that, let's, let's go with, that's a pretty good enough intro. Is this my water down here? Thank you. And uh, <clears throat> I'm going to share one more story before we get going. And so, uh, even though my daughter's here, it's fine. Um, so we were, as you know, we were on vacation for a couple weeks, and um, I, 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 I uh, bribed her boyfriend uh, to go play golf with me one morning. So we get up for the crack of dawn, and Cade and I go, and boy, he whoops me too, by the way. Tom, that's bad. He whoops me. Uh, he, he, he made me look like I didn't know how to know. He had the best round of his life, and I didn't. And so <clears throat> we get done. He's a good, good kid. Run. And we, I said, hey, you want to grab some lunch before we get back? And, of course, I did not realize, by the way, how possessive my daughter was over her boyfriend. But either way, she wasn't very, possessive is not a good word, angry that her dad decided to take her out for, you know, him to lunch afterwards. So we stop on the way back from the golf course to a restaurant, and we're sitting there talking. And, you know, he's asking me some questions, and it all went back to the word. And, I mean, I don't know the young man very well. Obviously, my daughter does. But he says to me one day, because I just want to be able to, when people come to me, I want to be able to lead them to the Word. I want to lead them to a point where, where my answer isn't just my opinion, but my Word, the Word of God. And I'm like, okay, there's, not that he, he doesn't need brownie points, trust me. He, he, you know what, when God brings people together, if it's meant to be, it doesn't. But, you know, and, and then we got talking about some of his friendships. And I brought it back to this where we're going today. And he, he said to me, I have some friends that call themselves Christians, but the way they live, just I don't, I don't even know if they are. But then I have Christians who are really Christian friends, but they're struggling with their lives. There's a difference between the two. And we, I began to share with them the very thing that I just told you of the John Bevere series. And he got so um, <laughs> moved by it, he asked me, could you forward me that? So I got on the app and I forwarded it on to him. And according to my daughter, he's already given that stuff off to his friends that were struggling. And did, you know what's really cool when you're sitting around people who have a perspective, even though we had a great round of golf, you, everything should always come back to the Lord. Everything should always come back to the Word. And this young man was really more excited about, I mean, I'm doing wrong, I think he's very excited about beating me. He just had to sh you know, sh show it a little bit less. But he, our next hour, was it about an hour, honey? Uh, maybe a little bit more? Was it okay? All I know is that his phone was blowing up where, where are you at? Why are you not back here at the resort? You know, I'm waiting for you. Either way. <clears throat> but it's really neat when you understand we have perspective difference. If Christ is the center of our focus, if he is, if Jesus is the one that we are living for, all these other things, yes, being on vacation is beautiful. And yet we had a great trip. We had some surprises. I'm, I'm not my, uh, some things that took place. What? It's public. I can announce. I'm allowed to now. Oh, my son. Get, but either way, while we were down in Aruba, we had a massive plan, those I don't know. But my son um, asked his girlfriend to marry him, her, uh, marry her, her to marry him, and uh, she said yes, by the way. Uh, just, you know, but the greater surprise of that was um, we got a hold of her parents through Joshua and flew the, her parents down there. And after they got engaged at the chapel, her parents surprised her at dinner. And she walked in and saw her mom and dad in Aruba, and um, it was an awesome weekend. So then we had an amazing weekend with her parents. We rented an Airbnb up, up, the, up the coast and had a wonderful, wonderful time just getting to know them a little bit and welcoming our families to be joined together, hopefully, in the next year. And uh, they're at that same location. And so, you know, we had a great trip. But you know what was really cool? Her dad and I, I think we talked more, I mean, in the pool, where we were, everything, we talked more about the Lord than, uh, and, and it was awesome to, to know that, you know, God brought my son and this, this, this his future wife together and her, her dad loves the Lord. Her mom, they love, they love the Lord. And some of our greatest fellowship is talking about, and, and as a matter of fact, I'm looking around making sure they weren't here, by the way, because they said, we're going to come and see your church. We want to, because they, uh, they go to a big, big church, and they thought, we'd be love to come down. But their daughter worked today, and uh, I think Joshua slept in, right? But either way, we had a great trip. But 
you know, as much as we want to have those perspectives in our lives, God's doing some awesome things. And so there, that, that was just a fun announcement for you all to know. And uh, it's also, I, I guess it is on social media, so I'm okay talking about it. I've gotten in a little bit of trouble the last couple of weeks, by the way, just getting excited for my kids. But all right, so Psalm 73, let's get going to the message this morning, and we're really going to get our, our focus. This is, this is, to me, the epitome of where a lot of Christians live. And starting in verse 1, truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. So we just acknowledge in verse 1 that God is good. He's good to them. He's good to everybody. God's good. But look at this, the psalmist says here in, 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 in verse 2. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well uh, nigh slipped. For I was envious of the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no bands around the death, and their, their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore, pride compasses them about a chain. Violence covers them as, as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness, and they have uh, more than their heart could wish for. They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily, and they set their mouths against the heavens, and they, the, the tongue uh, walketh through the earth. Therefore, his people return hither. And the waters are full, a cup of wrung out of them. And they say, how does God know? How is their knowledge in the most high? Behold, they are, in, they are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Verily, I have cleansed my heart in vain. I have washed my hands innocently. For all the day long I have been plagued and chastened every morning. If I say, I will speak this boldly, I should offend against a generation of thy children. Stop for a second. This to me is one of the most sad description of the way a lot of Christians live. Envious of the world, looking at what they're doing and saying, well, they're rich, they're healthy, they're, they're, they're this, they're this, and like, I'm trying to serve God and I live my life the way I am. And when we are living in a perspective that we're seeing their prosperity, you know what the Bible says? Sin is good for a season. The Bible talks about the, 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 the rain falls on the just and the unjust alike. That means that both the just and the unjust will prosper. It doesn't say that, you know, only, only God's people prosper. The world around us will prosper. We look at the ways of the wicked right now, and it seems to be they're getting more favor than we are. And if you can get lost in this, whether it's politically, whether it's sin in your life, whether it's uh, money, whether it's your job, whether it's promotion, whatever it might be, when we start looking at life through the lens and the perspective of the fact that it's not fair, they're doing something we can't do, they're blessed, here I am giving my whole life to this God that is supposed to be awesome to me, and I'm not even as good as they are, you start getting these little strongholds built up in your mind, and you get mindsets built against God. There's a lot of Christians that over the years I've talked to that said, you know, I'd serve God, but... Those buts are based on observations we have made that are wrongly focused. We are focusing on Christianity the wrong way. The end result of today having a relationship with Jesus is that a relationship with Jesus. I believe with everything in me. I believe I'm a faith message guy. I believe it. I believe that the Christians should prosper. The Christians should be healed. Christians should live a sin-free life. These are all things the Bible gives us access to and provision for. But it doesn't mean we live in this fallen world 100% like we should. Would you agree? Because we all are not living sin-free. We're all not living probably in the fullness of the prosperity the Lord promised us to live. And we're also not living 100% healthy-free. But I know God's Word doesn't change, so we have to realign our focus to line up with His focus. But you know what? It's that the prize is not about being prosperous. The prize is not about being healed. You know, when you lose people you love, like I, you know, we get it, we, we on this side of earth struggle. We have lost, we mourn. But you know, prospectively, eternally, they just met Jesus. Monday, October 3rd of 2022, 
when my mom closed her eyes here, she saw Jesus. Hmm. Wow. Perspective. Seeing Jesus in your everyday life is the prize, is the focus. And when we are focusing on the wrong thing, we're seeing their, how, how good they're doing, and we see how bad we're doing. It's almost a comparison. And then we start living out of comparison rather than living in Jesus. When Matthew, Matthew 6, 33, everybody knows it. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. When you seek Jesus, and you're seeking in his perspective in life what decisions you make, when you make poor decisions, you get poor consequences. But when you're seeking Jesus, you don't make those decisions, and therefore your consequences are blessed. I truly believe, as Christians, one of the reasons why we're not walking in the fullness of the life that's been promised us is our perspective is we're making worldly decisions. We're making worldly perspective choices. And the consequences of those are not living in the blessing of the Lord. We get greedy. We get this, we get this, and then all of a sudden we get presumptuous. One of the worst things that happens as Christians, we start presuming and making assumptions about the way we think things should be, and yet we haven't truly consulted the Lord. And our perspective now is gone. We're, we're comparing ourselves, the world's getting this and we're not. But then verse 16 might be when I highlight verses in my Bible. This one's highlighted, it's starred, it's got writing on both sides, and it's underlined. This is a very important verse to me because this is going to change perspective of the psalmist here. Verse 16. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. When I realized that my perspective was out here, I saw the pain it was causing me. I was losing my focus. I was losing my ability to see Jesus and, and his kingdom it became painful to me. And verse 17, I was wrong, one verse off, is the highlighted one. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, and then I understood their end. Until I came to a place where I saw Jesus. Until I came to his presence and I saw their end, and I saw what true eternity was about. I really have some bad news for people out there. Wide is the gate that leads to destruction. Narrow is the gate that leads to righteousness. There are a lot of people in the world today that name the name of Jesus but are going to come to him on that last day and say, Lord, Lord, I've done all these things in your name. I've done this. But they did not know him. They knew of him. They went to church. They talked about him. They preached. They, they said, we prophesied in your name. There's people who even didn't went that far. But they didn't know him. When we come to a place as Christians, the number one focus in my life ought to be every morning, I want to wake up and I want to know him. Paul says the best in Philippians 3, that I might know him in the power of his resurrection, through the fellowship of his sufferings, that being conformable unto his death. That I know him that well from every aspect, from life, burial, resurrection. I know that kind of power and that kind of life inside of me. Paul also says in one of my favorite prayers in all of the Bible, in Ephesians 2, that I might know the love of God, experience every single day his love for me. And when you have that kind of relationship, you're not focusing on what the world's doing. You're not focusing on, on, on whether you're, you're, you're living this way or this way. Your focus now becomes completely on Jesus. You see their end. Their end is not joyful. I can see the end of Christians right now. We have some very good friends of ours that were uh, on vacation with us. And right before they left, um, actually, it's funny. When we were in Colorado with him a couple weeks, months ago, he got a bad report um, and, and some, some things. And then um, right before this trip, she got a bad report. Got back, and the report's not any better. And, um, you know, uh, we had some really good conversations and uh, we look forward to obviously, obviously getting out there and praying with her before um, they're looking at doing some surgery. But when you see sickness, it's real. Sin is real. Pain is real. But if we can change our perspective and see Jesus in it, we can see who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scoring his shame, seeing himself seated at the right hand of God. When we see Hebrews 
12 come alive, that we're seeing through the pain, we're seeing through the problem, we're seeing through the cancer, we're seeing through the whatever. We see Jesus on the other side, seated on the throne, victoriously reigning as a champion. And we can go and have that same perspective who Jesus at the cross saw the pain. He took it for you. And when we can start getting our lives realigned that way, until I came into the sanctuary of God and I saw the red, I saw prospectively my life was looking the wrong way. One of the things I'll be sharing in January is this. You cannot say you love the Lord and everything have you and still love the world. We have to stop loving the things of the world. That even means the good in comparison to loving Jesus. I believe this. If you can, you can take the blessing of the Lord and make it an idol. You can prove it with your children, by the way. Anybody have kids? Yeah, and they can be idols. When they become more of a focus and more of a priority than even the things of God, they're an idol in your life. Blessing and prosperity of the Lord can be an idol. Your job can be an idol. Church can be an idol. Anything that we do that puts perspective above God is, is idolatry. And that's why even in 1 John it deals with it very directly idolatry will rob you of relationship with Jesus. Let's keep reading. So as he saw, as he has this encounter with the Lord, and it changes his perspective, this is what happens in verse 18. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places, thou canst uh, them down to destruction. How are they brought into desolation? As a moment, they are utterly consumed with terror. As a dream, when one awakes, so, O Lord, when thou awakest, thou shalt despise the, their image. First step, he starts seeing their, their issues. As he saw, as he sought the Lord, he began to see the truth about their lives. Some of the richest people in the world, some of the most miserable people in the world. Some of the healthiest people in the world probably are not as healthy as you think. We, when we start seeing from God's perspective, he starts saying, wait a minute here. That, that my presumptions, because I'm looking at it from the wrong point of view, is probably wrong. And then it goes on to say in verse 21, Thus my heart was grieved, and I was poked in my reins. So foolish was I, ignorant as a beast before thee. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold me in my right hand. Thou shalt guide me with your counsel, and afterward you shall receive me. This is, it's, it's phenomenal. This is one of my favorite parts of the Scripture. Once I see perspective and once I get to a point of I'm seeing Jesus for who he is, he says this. He says, first of all, I know that you didn't leave me. You're still with me. One of the greatest joys I can give you going into, into the series I'll be doing in January was this. When we get our perspective right and we start loving him and hating the things that he hates and loving the things that he loves, you will know that God is with you no matter what. Even in sin, he still loves you. Even in strongholds, He still loves you. He's not going to stop loving you. He still wants to be with you. He is jealous over your time. I love that verse so much. I told you years ago when Oprah Winfrey made the comment publicly that I could never serve that God because of that verse that says He's a jealous God. Isn't it sad how you took it the wrong way? My God is jealous over me. He wants to be with me. He doesn't want anything to replace him in my life. He's that jealous. He's like the one that says, I don't want nothing in front of me. I want you to myself. That's intimacy. That's a jealousy, that, that's a jealousy that's good. And he wants that. He longs for that in our lives. And as Pastor Kenny has been sharing so many year, weeks and weeks and weeks, and as you're going to see some new uh, markings on the walls and everything else, Jesus wants us way more than we want him. He died first. He loved us first. Everything was done and initiated by him. Salvation is a response to what he did. Yes, it's free will. We still have to choose. But it was initiated by God. It was his love that drew him to that cross for us. And our life today needs to start re reflecting that when we come into the sanctuary of the Lord and we see the way they are, are we seeing ourselves the way we are? He loves me. He's going to be with me. And then he says, as he's with me, he's going to hold me. I don't know, that's pretty awesome. Some of you that are struggling in the room, 
obviously we're standing with David and his family and we're doing some other things and there's so many things going on. Do you realize that the Lord Jesus himself just doesn't want you to know he's with you, but he wants to know he's actually holding you? He's got you. He's covering you. He's El Shaddai. And we can come under the shadow of his wings and be protected there from fear and pain and anger and pride and sin of all kinds. And he's not only with me, but he's holding me. He's embracing me. He's comforting me. He's protecting me. He's loving me. Not only are when we start seeing Jesus from the perspective of in his sanctuary that he's not like that, we're starting to find out that he wants something more than just to be a, a, a far off God. He wants to know that he's right there. He's with us. And then he says, then after he's, will, he's holding me, he wants to guide me. He wants to change my path. You realize, as Christians, if you find error in your way, repentance is changing your path. You've got to stop doing what you've been doing. And repentance means to turn the other direction. And we have to let him guide you. That means you have to make some changes in your life. It means we have to make some choices based on his perspective, not yours. And then it says this, after that, after that, then I see him. He guides me and then he receives me into his own one day. One day we get to be with him. That's the perspective. So what happens to the psalmist here, he cries out, when we, we, we start seeing things from the wrong perspective, we get in the presence of the Lord. He changes my perspective. And I love this because John Beaver also wrote the book, and I think it's probably a teaching series too. S start seeing things from an eternal perspective. When you start seeing things from an eternal perspective, you start realizing that the things that we're going through every single day is temporal. Even though I was pretty excited last night to walk down the streets of Indianapolis, the University of Michigan, the win last night is temporal. Now, according to Christy, if they play Alabama, it's going to be done anyways, right? I mean, we're, we're, we're done. But either way, I look at life, and I have fun with it. I have fun watching sports. I have fun going to different events. We have fun doing a lot of things, but those are temporal. And if we get our focus too much on stuff like that, as much as I do, I love college football. I love a lot of things. I, I, we enjoy our vacations. But if you focus on all the pleasure in life being temporal, you're missing the eternal joy of knowing Jesus. You're missing, you know, one of the things I do love is that one of the greatest players on the Michigan team um, is an amazing Christian young man. And uh, every time he was interviewed last year, he used to, he used to play offense and he switched to defense. He's become the, the leader of the defense and he's an outspoken Christian. And last night he won the MVP for the defense. And when he did, the first thing he said, he goes, this is a team win, but before I do that, I want to tell you all glory of everything I've done on this field goes to Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. You know what? And 65,000 people erupt, and little do they know they're erupting over something they probably did. It's just a, it's just a click, click to them. But I know that young man because I've heard him talk many times, and it's real to him. Those type of testimonies, I have no idea what it's going to be. But to me, he had an eternal perspective. Yes, they just won the Big Ten. Yes, they won the big game of the year. Guess what? It's still about Jesus. You can have fun with things in the world. But make sure Jesus is the center of it all. Jesus has to be eternally the perspective that we're going to. Secondly, let's keep reading. We're not done yet. Nevertheless, uh, okay, when I, then, oh, in verse 25, ready? We, we got the... the this is, this is the ending now. Whom have I in heaven but you? There's no one on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart will fail. But God, I'm going to change a little bit. God, you are the strength of my heart and the portion forever. For lo, they are far from thee that shall perish. And, they, uh, and thou hast destroyed all them that go uh, whoring from thee. <laughs> But it's good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God, and that I might declare his works. This morning, as the ushers are getting ready for communion, I would like to take communion this morning and see something I'm going to share from applying to this. I want to look at the bread and the juice from a new perspective today. I want a new perspective over my relationship with the Lord in many ways. I don't want to see old things and just the way it used to be. I want to see Jesus in everything we're doing. And as you see the bread, you see the juice, what do you see in that? 
you see the body and the blood of Jesus. Pretty awesome. This isn't just a, 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 a meal we take. This isn't just, you know, eating a cracker and uh, you can come on up. Thanks, guys. Um, this isn't just eating a cracker and, and, and drinking some grape juice. We're not using real wine yet. No, we're not using real wine. Okay, good. Just making sure. But, uh, you know, is, is it the Catholic Church? Thank you. I'll grab one of these. The Catholic Church, uh, you know, um, does the real wine. I think it's pretty good. So, uh, actually, I hate, I hate the stuff they use. Uh, have you ever been to the church where they get, you get there, you get real? It's like, oh, it's, it's, it tastes like, you know, kerosene. But anyway, so back to this. Um, as you're taking the, bre- the bread and the juice this morning, I want you to, like the psalmist here, I want you to take a, a look at your life. And we're going into the Christmas season, which is pretty awesome. It's all about Jesus, the birth of this baby who came to this earth knowing he had one goal, to seek and save us that were lost. But you know, after he found us and after we received, well, he really didn't have to find us, right? He knew we were the whole time. But after, after he sought us out and we said yes and we received this wonderful gift of salvation, do you know this, that was just the beginning? Kind of like when you're married, the adventure begins. It's knowing each other through the good and the bad. It's knowing him. And the problem is, all the bad doesn't come from him. That's normally on our side. <laughs> it's normally our choices that cause the bad. But today, as we see this bread, we see this, I want to see a perspective difference for us. As we look at this, 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 this cracker, it represents the body of Christ. What is the body of Christ? It was that which was beaten, broken, and bruised. Isaiah 53 says, they couldn't even recognize him. He was so badly beaten. Why would a man endure such stuff? Why? Because his focus wasn't on his pain. It was focused on our salvation. Focus, perspective. Jesus knew going into the cross that his perspective was eternal. Tomorrow morning when you get up, this afternoon you leave this place, I'm asking and believing that God will transform our mindsets from a temporal to an eternal perspective. When we start seeing things like the, this, this, the first part of the psalm, we start seeing all the things and we start getting distracted over the very number one thing Kenny's been sharing for the same story, I think, for over a year. And he just keeps finding its way back in each sermon about Mary and Martha. Mary, this one thing you've done, one thing, is to sit at his feet and worship. When we get a perspective of Jesus in that. Now, where I'm going to go with this before I close, before we do the communion, is this. <clears throat> John Bevere made a statement that, um, for some reason, I don't know why, it... Um, it did something in my heart. And a lot of it was because the phone call I got leading up to me watching or listening to this series was somebody who was in a lot of struggle in their life. A lot of struggle. They were in uh, addictions and some things that were just really, really bad. And so as I was listening to this series, it, it, I think my heart, my heart was also going out to realizing the person. But he makes a statement. And those that don't know, John Bevere had an, uh, an issue with pornography for years. And um, he, he had um, Lester Summerall went up and prayed for him one time. And he said, Lester Summerall, and those who don't, Lester Summerall, he's a powerful man of God. And he was doing a series, and Lester was at his church, or somehow they were in the same meeting. He said, I, need, I have an addiction, and I, I'm struggling. I need you to pray for me. So Lester Summerall went in there with his powerful praying, if you ever know, and just went all out. Because if you know Lester Summerall, if you've ever heard him or watched him, he does not have anything with, with he has one, one steam. It's all st- full steam ahead. And Lester Summerall will yell and scream, and he'll, get the, he'll take authority like you won't believe. And he said, you know, that day, I should have been free. But I wasn't. Months later, I went on a trip. And I did some prayer and fasting. And that was the weekend that I got set free. And a couple of years later, he asked, Lord, I don't understand what happened. I had some of most, well, the most powerful men of God in the world that does deliverance ministry pray for me. And yet I stood and fasted and prayed. And I got free. And this is what the Lord spoke to him. He said, 
It's because when Lester Summerall prayed for you, you didn't hate the sin enough. You still enjoyed it. I tell you, the reason why we have to be careful of perspective differences in our life is this. Until you hate the things that God hates and love the things that God loves, it's hard to have fellowship with him. 